Amen. So Luke chapter 2, uh, of course, is the quintessential kind of um, Christmas you know, story you turn to. It's got a lot of the elements uh, of, of Christ's birth. And it's probably my favorite passage when it comes to, it comes to this. And really the, my favorite part there is, is verses 8 through 16 where he talks about the, the shepherds. You know, every time I read that, I always think about what it would have been like there to be there that night. Uh, to see those sights to, that they got to see and, and how uh, you know, amazing that must have been to them. And we'll pick it up there in verse 8. It says, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel of the Lord said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a great multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, good will toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph, and the babe lying in a manger. And really what I want to focus in on this, this, this evening is that phrase there in verse 14 where it says, where the angels proclaimed, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's the title of the sermon, Glory, Peace, and Goodwill. Because that's really the message, that's really what is resulting here because of this message of Christ's birth. And really that's what Christ's birth you know, resulted in for us. And we could see that, you know, th this message that is brought to the shepherds, really, this is a reflection of what Christ's life was. I mean, his life was one that brought glory. His one was, life was one that brought peace. His life was one that brought goodwill toward men. And he accomplished that through, uh, you know, his death, of course, but also through his birth. You know, without his birth, he wouldn't have been able to, to die for us either. But not only is it, is it the reflection of what Christ did for us, but it's all, you know, it's, it, or what his life was, but really it's a reflection what of what our lives ought to be. Because Christ is our example. You know, we are to look to him. How he lived his life is how we ought to live our life. And if, if the message of Christ's birth resulted in this proclamation of glory to God, of peace and goodwill, you know, our lives ought to proclaim that same thing. You know, our lives should result in God being glorified. Our lives should result in peace. Our lives should result in goodwill toward men. And one of the first things that Jesus, or we see in this proclamation is glory. You know, and Jesus was born to bring glory to God. And he did that through his whole life. If you would go over to John chapter 12, John chapter 12. And of course, you know, you know we bring glory to God when we praise him. You know, we come, we sing, we pray. We, you know, we, we, we do different things in our life that bring glory to God. But one way that Jesus brought glory to God was through his suffering. You know, the fact that he was obedient to the death of the cross, that brought glory to the Father. And he said there in John chapter 12, verse 23, And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat shall fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this, uh, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then there came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So, of course, Jesus is talking about the fact that he's approaching his death. He knew that he was going to suffer on the cross. He was going to suffer the shame and reproach. And he said, this is the reason why I'm here. And then, of course, he says there, Father, glorify thy name. And God says, you know, the Father replies and says, I will, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. Go over to John chapter 17, verse 1. John chapter 17, verse 1. You know, our lives ought to result in bringing glory to God. That's what Jesus did. You know, when he was born, you know, even at his birth, the angels are proclaiming glory to God. You know, there, today there's a Savior born in the city of Bethlehem, you know. That, that was something that, that, that was proclaimed, but then, you know, that resulted in God being glorified, and our lives ought to glorify God too. But what we need to understand is sometimes in order to bring glory to God, 
we might have to suffer. Maybe not to the degree that Christ did, but there's going to be some suffering in this life. And if, if we, you know, if we go through this life and we're able to, uh, you know, go through that suffering and, and, and take it patiently and be willing to bear our cross, you know, that's going to result in glory to God. Sometimes we can't always understand that. We can't see how, you know, why is it that I have to go through this particular trial, this particular temptation or struggle in my life? Why is it that I have to go and suffer the way that I do? I don't see how God's going to be glorified, but if we just remain faithful and we go through it, God will glorify, be glorified through that. He said in John chapter 17, verse 1, it says there, uh, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power of all, all flesh, that he should give, him, uh, give light, eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So Jesus, in his suffering, by going and facing the cross, brought glory to God. <clears throat> and we think, you know, often we think about this, this, how the suffering of Christ brought glory to God. It wasn't just the suffering of the cross. You have to remember that when, you know, Christ was born in, in Bethlehem, when he became, you know, that babe in the manger and then went on to live, uh, you know, for 30 years, 30, 33 years on this earth, you know, that was a big step down for him. <laughs> we don't know what that was like because we've never been glorified. You know, we're not God like Jesus was here. You know, glorify me which, uh, with the, the glory which I had with thee before the world was. You know, he ever has always existed. He's the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. He's always been the Son of God. So we don't know what it's like to, to, to you know, exist prior to, you know, putting on this robe of flesh like he did. You know, he came down, and, and that was quite the condescension. In fact, go to Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2. When he keeps something, get to Philippians 2, keep something there, we're going to come back to it. But, you know, the suffering of Christ isn't just the cross. It's the fact that, you know, he left heaven. He left glory. He left his Father. He left all of that behind to come down and dwell among sinful men and to, to bear the reproach and the suffering. And, and, he, you know, and of course, that was necessary. And not only that, but it, you know, the Bible teaches us that because of that, he's able to you know, sympathize with what we go through. Like there's no temptation such as taking you, but it's common to man. And, and you know, God is faithful that he will you know, make a way to escape and be able to bear it. But God can also, he can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities because of the fact that he went through that suffering. Not just the suffering of the cross, but the suffering that is just inherent in life. You know, no one, even, even the world goes through suffering. Even the unsaved, they suffer. It's not like, you know, people who don't get saved, they, that they live a, a, a life without suffering. They do. That's just inherent in, 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 in human life, just living. And that's part of that suffering that Christ took upon himself as well. And it says in Philippians chapter 2, again, Christ did all this to be an example to us. He said, Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputa reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being in, fa found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So, just as Christ's birth should result in glory and peace and goodwill, so also all our lives, you know, being born again, should result in those same things. But, you know, as far as glory goes, it might not come the way we would like it. It might come through suffering. But we should be willing to, like it says here, let this mind be in us, as also was in Christ Jesus. To be willing to, to be made of no reputation, to took a, take upon yourselves the form of a servant, and become obedient, and if necessary, even obedient unto the death of the cross. You know, we should be willing to suffer in order that we might glorify God. That was the message that was brought to those shepherds that night. <clears throat> We've been born again to glorify God, and we also do this through suffering. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4, If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. You know, if you suffer for Christ's sake, you know, happy are ye, the Bible says. He says that, you know, it, when we, we should rejoice when we are persecuted for righteousness' sake. That, we, that should be something that we rejoice over. And that's a good thing that when we suffer as a Christian. Why? Because God is glorified. Because it brings glory to God. 
And not only that, you know, we should also be willing to condescend like Christ did. You want to bring glory to God in your life? Well, then you might have to be willing to suffer for Christ as a Christian, but you also should be willing to condescend. The Bible, you know. And that word, we use it today as kind of uh, you know, a bad thing to do. People say, you know, don't condescend, you know, be so condescending. You know, and, and of course, in certain contexts, you know, being a condescending person is not good when you're just kind of always talking down to people. But we should be willing to condescend to men of low estate, is what the Bible says in Romans. It says in t- Romans chapter 12, be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. You know, there, should no, there shouldn't be any group of people that we're just above. Or there shouldn't be, you know, a, a great example of this would be, you know, with our soul winning. You know, we don't just want to go to the gated communities. One, because we'll probably get kicked out and probably we won't be that you know, receptive. But, you know, we should go to the people of low estate, the people that the world would say, you know, there's no value here. They're not going to, you know, these people don't have, they're not going to bring, you know, a big uh, check into your church. They're not going to help you build some massive building or some huge ministry. But so what? That's not what it's about. about. It's about reaching them with the gospel. You know, we should be willing to condescend to, to men of low estate because they're the most receptive. I mean, look who Christ condescended to in his birth. Did he go find King Herod? You know, the murderer who went and killed all the babies, you know, a few years later? Did he go find some, you know, somebody with a big reputation that could, you know, get his name out there and let everybody know that Christ was come? No, he found shepherds. You know, and, and I've mentioned this before, you know, in our modern culture, we kind of romanticize that idea of being a shepherd. But it's not exactly the most, you know, uh, glorious job. It's often reserved for people, you know, that were told, you know, <laughs> I mean, be the guy in the family that said, hey, you're going to keep the sheep. You know, you're going to be the one that goes out and we won't see you for weeks at a time. You're going to go sleep in the cold and the heat. You know, maybe that might not be the job that you want. You know, but that's who Christ came and found. Just lowly shepherds that were just doing their job one night. But, and they got to see, you know, all, the, all those angels show up and they hear this amazing message. And then they got to go and behold Christ in the manger. They got to go see him at his birth. Not these big shots, not people that were, you know, had big influence. They were just simple, humble men of low estate. And, you know, that Christ's birth is an example to us to, one, to be willing to suffer as a Christian, but two, to be willing to condescend to other people. You know, meet people where they're at. And never come across somebody and think, well, you know, they're, they're, they're beneath me in some way. You know, that, that should never be our attitude. Well, I'd preach the gospel to them, but, you know, look at them. You know, or look how they're dressed, or look where they live, or look how they behave, or how they smell, you know, or whatever. You know, you should be willing to condescend to people of low estate. <coughs> so we see, first of all, that when Jesus was born, what that resulted in was this message of glory and peace and goodwill. So he was not only born to bring glory to God, but he was also born to bring peace. And if you would go back to John chapter 14, John chapter 14. And you have to kind of think this one through, okay? Because a lot of times when you, people love to, th- you know, this is that phrase you always see on the Christmas the cards, right? Go, you know, good, you know, uh, peace on earth, you know, goodwill toward men. He's not talking about world peace. You know, a lot of people like, you know, the Jimmy Carters of this world and so on and so forth. They like to, you know, bless are the peacemakers. You know, he's not talking about, you know, having some UN uh, sanctioned, you know, meeting with Israel and Palestine and, you know, and joining hands together with them and, you know, bringing world peace. That's not the peace that he's talking about here. Now, there will be world peace eventually one day when Christ comes back to reign, but that's after a bloodbath. That's after, you know, the great tribulation, God's wrath being poured out, and a lot of people dying. Yeah, then there's going to be peace, and then it's going to be peace or else. That's not the type of peace that the world is looking for. You know, they want world peace through compromise, through people, you know, just, you know, giving up their beliefs or their standards, so on and so forth. That's not the peace that Christ brings. But he does bring true peace, lasting peace. And Jesus even said, you know, think not I've come to send peace on, on earth. So you have to kind of think this through. Well, wait a minute. The angels are saying peace on earth at his birth. And then Jesus is showing up 30 years later and saying, I could come to send peace on earth. Don't think that. What does he mean here? He said, I came not to send peace, but a sword. And he went on, and we know the passage. And he said, a man's foe shall be there of his own house. And he come to set uh, you know, people at variance, one against another, even in their own, amongst their own family. And we know that Christ, you know, people, when they get saved, often that's what happens. 
But I believe the peace that the angels are talking about there is the peace with God. That's the goodwill or the peace that he's talking about. Not just goodwill amongst ourselves. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the fact that when Christ came, that was God's, you know, that was God's uh, 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 pe expressing his willingness to have peace with men. Like the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, you know, that to be our, we are to be reconciled with God. You know, be reconciled with God. I mean, what does it mean to come to a, rec a reconciliation? You know, if we were to reconcile some people to, to one to another, you know, that would, that would mean that they would be at peace, meaning this, that they had previously had conflict. And that's what the Bible's talking about, this peace, meaning this, that without Christ, you know, we are, we are, enmities, we are at enmity with God. We are without hope in this world. And when Christ was born, that peace that he brought was not world peace, but it was the peace between sinner and God. And he was, well, that, that was God, you know, God's olive branch, so to speak. That's him saying, hey, you know, I'm willing to reconcile you unto myself through the Christ, through his birth, life, death, burial, and resurrection. So that's what he's talking about, the peace with God through salvation. Right? In John chapter 14, Jesus said, verse 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He's saying, look, the peace that he's giving is his peace, not the world's version of peace, where everyone just, you know, glosses over everybody else's sin, everybody's abomin abominations, everybody else's, you know, injustice and, and everything else. And just say, well, we're just not, you know, we're just going to all get along, which never happens, by the way, and never will happen. But the peace that Christ gives is the peace that a man can, and, and, you know, that we as sinners can have towards God. <clears throat> the Bible says in Romans 5, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Christ's life, you know, he, he, his life, man, you know, when it, it, it resulted in the glorification of God and also it brought peace to us. It brought peace to the earth, but it brought it, meaning it's, it's between man and God. Now, not only that, but we should also have, we can have peace with God, right? We, we understand that through Christ, but I believe part of that also is that we can have peace with brethren. That, that is something else our life should, uh, you know, result in. You know, just like Christ's life, when his birth came, resulted in glory, peace, and goodwill, because we've been born again, our lives should also result in these things too. You know, we're not going to save the world, obviously, you know, we're not going to die for people's sins, you know, like Christ did, and bring peace that way, but we can bring peace one to another amongst brethren. Right through unity in the local church. If you would go over to Philippians chapter two, Philippians chapter two, and this is one thing that you know I, I hope that we always have in our church and we always st strive to maintain is unity in the local church, because it's so important. Uh, you know, churches fall apart, churches split, and and, and when, when there's a lack of unity, and. The real tragedy in that is that when that happens, when a church becomes ununified, when there isn't unity there, it can't accomplish the goal that it, that, that it should be accomplishing. You know, the work often will go undone. I mean, it'd be a real shame if in 2021 something happened and this church just fell apart. You know, something, you know, we were attacked or whatever, or, uh, people get out of sorts, whatever it is, however it happens or happened, you know, hypothetically speaking. It'd be a real shame if this church lost unity. And I'm glad that we have it, you know, it's, and it's a precious thing, but it has to, it's something that has to be maintained. You know, why, then why, if not, then why is Paul so often admonishing the local church to, to have unity? And it'd be a real shame if we lost it because of the fact that the work of preaching the gospel to every soul in Tucson would go undone. And not just that, but the, 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 you know, think about the, 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 the lives, the, the people that are growing up in the church, the, the people that are, you know, our, our own lives would be affected by it. You know, not, not just to mention all the souls that would go and say, but even our own lives would be affected if something were to happen in this church, if we were to lose unity. You know, and our lives should result in peace. And we can find, and we, you know, that'll manifest itself through unity in local church. Look at Philippians chapter 2, it says in verse 1, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, 
Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded. So this was Paul's prayer. This was what Paul wanted. He said, you want to make me happy? You want to fulfill my joy? You want to do me a favor? You want to, you know, he said, hey, you want to repay Paul for what he's done for you? Then be at peace one with another. Have unity. Be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. I mean, that, that was what Paul wanted more than anything for these people, for the Philippians, is that they would be of one accord, one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. There's that condescension again. So again, how are we going to achieve this, 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 unity in lowly, uh, and, excuse me, this unity in the local church? It's through condescending, you know, uh, 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 and, and, and not in a bad way, but of, uh, uh, in, in, in esteeming each better than themselves, that we should esteem other better than themselves. That's how you're going to achieve unity in the local church and maintain it. So you see that Christ, you know, his life, not only did it result in, you know, him bringing the glory to God through his suffering, through his life, and we can also do that, and not only that, but he brought, uh, you know, peace to man through his birth, and, and we can do that in the local church, but he also brought peace to, uh, to mankind, right? He brought to mankind in general, to everybody. In fact, the Bible says there, he said, uh, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth, uh, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And, and, and so I mean, he didn't say some men. He's saying, you know, everybody, goodwill toward mankind, goodwill toward everybody. So we should also try to bring peace to everybody that we can as well. You know, we're going to do that through what? Through preaching the gospel. <clears throat> if you would, go over to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. This isn't going to be a long message tonight. I'm almost done. But the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You know, when we're out there preaching the gospel, we're not just, what we're preaching is the gospel of peace. We're preaching the same message that these angels preached all these years ago when Christ was born. We're preaching that same message of peace and goodwill. And if people will receive that, if people will receive that message even today, you know what, their, their lives will bring glory to God. Look at Romans chapter 10, verse 13. It says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him on whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Say, so how am I going to, you know, result, how am I going to bring forth peace like Jesus did? Well, you know, how are you going to bring forth goodwill toward all men like Jesus did through his birth? You can do it by preaching the gospel, by going out there and reaching mankind, your fellow man, condescending a man of low estate like Jesus did, and, and, and preaching the, the, the message of peace, the gospel of peace. You know, it's, it's, it, as much as I love this story, and I would love to have been that, you know, say, if you could be any person, you know, in, in, the, in the, the, uh, the nativity, nativity story, you know, the, the, the story of Christ's birth, who would you be? You know, I've thought about this. Like, if I could play one, because, you know, when you're growing up, if you're in a, a lot of times schools and stuff, you actually act this out. Like, you know, you're going to be the, this and you're going to be that. My kids were talking about it. Like, who would do what? And who's going to play what part? Who's going to be Mary? Who's going to be Joseph? You know, I would want to be the shepherd. You know, if I could actually go back and, and, and take the, the place of somebody in this story, I think being the shepherd would be pretty cool. Not because being a shepherd's cool, right? Although, you know, maybe it is. I don't know. You get to be outdoors. But, you know, you'd get to see something pretty great, wouldn't you? I mean, what, that not everybody got to see what they saw. I mean, to see heaven open and see all those angels praising, glorifying God. And you can see why it says when the angels showed up, they were terrified. They were afraid. And they had to tell them, you know, you know don't be afraid. You know, we're bringing glad tidings. It was a frightful thing that they saw. And then just all of a sudden see the whole sky filled up with all these angels all praising God and glorifying God like that. I mean, it, it's just to think about it. Just, it's amazing. I would have loved to have been there. But here's the thing. That'll never happen. <laughs> I'll never be them, right? Well, I can only, I can only dream, you know, I, you know, but hey, you got to have a dream in life, right? But here's the thing. We can be like those angels in some ways. 
That's what I was thinking about. I was like, you know, we might not be able to experience what the shepherds experienced, but we can in some way be like the angels in that story because we bring that same message today. You know, if we'll do what Jesus did, condescend of, mon- of low estate, you know, if we'll humble ourselves and, and become servants of Christ and go out and, and, and try to bring the gospel of peace and goodwill toward men, you know, we're like those angels. We're bringing that same message. You know, it's not, obviously it's not going to be with all the glory that they had. You know, that no one's going to, you're not going to have to knock on the door and, and, and they're going to open the door and, and be affrighted at the sight of you. Well, maybe they will, but not for the same reasons, right? <laughs> You're not going to say, you know, be not afraid. You know, I bring glad tidings. You know, it's, it's, they're just going to be probably be like, if anything, you're afraid. You know, some, sometimes these guys come to the door and you're kind of like, boop, you know. <laughs> you have to remind yourself, don't be afraid. It's all right. Okay. But you're still bringing that same message. You know what? And, and, if, and if we'll do that, that might result, have the same results. That there would be, you know, goodwill and peace on earth toward all men. You know, and, and, and <coughs> that's what Jesus was born that's why he was born. He was born out of goodwill toward men. And it resulted in that. You know, his life resulted in, you know, goodwill, peace toward all men. And if we, we as Christians who have been born again, we should try to live our lives to demonstrate the, those same things. You know, our lives should result in these same things. You know, the angels should be able to look at our lives and say, hey, look at so-and-so. You know, and say, we, we, we looked at his life. We see the way that this person's living. And you know what? Glory to God for what they're doing. Glory to God for the, for the sin they're getting out of their life. Glory to God for the, the, the stands they're taking, the standards they're bringing into their life. Glory to God for you know, their faithfulness. Glory to, you know, and, and peace on earth. You know, the, the, the peace that this, these people are bringing to their local church. The peace that they're bringing uh, through, the, through preaching the gospel. The goodwill that they have toward others. You know, trying, to, trying to help their fellow man. Our lives should result in the same things. You know, maybe we're not going to have a, a, you know, a choir of angels you know, proclaiming these things and for us, obviously. But you know what? We can still manifest these things in our life. And Jesus is, is our example of that. You know, and of course, he was able to do it perfectly because he was God, but he did it and set the example for us. You know, and I don't know that we're ever going to have to go to the lengths that Jesus did to glorify God. I mean, he had to go, he had to become obedient even unto death and the suffering of the cross in, in order to glorify God the way he did. You know, we probably aren't ever going to have to, you know, in all likelihood, go to that length. But we can still glorify God through, you know, obeying his word, keeping his word, keeping his commandments. So, I, you know, that's the message I wanted to bring tonight for, for the Christmas sermon. You know, it's something to think about in this new year that we're coming into. You know, let's endeavor this year to be a year of. Our, you know, and every year after this, not just, just, just think about this, you know, we think about this story, you know, once around Christmas. Everyone gets real nice around Christmas. You ever notice that? <laughs> it just seems like every, you know, even I get nicer. You know, I've been working on it, okay? You know, I'm, I'm even, I remember I pulled out of my driveway today to come down here, and I, you know, sometimes you, 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 you come to that, that, that stoplight or the stop sign, and there's never a pedestrian there, so you just kind of always pull right up there. I did that, you know, at the end of my block, and, and I looked, and there's a guy trying to cross the street, and I could tell he was a little upset that he was going to have to walk out in front of the van, and, and, you know, so what did I do? I put it in reverse, I waved, and backed it up, you know? Probably just because it's Christmas, you know, and I've been listening to all the songs, I've been reading the story, and hearing the preaching, and I'm thinking, hey, goodwill toward men, let me back the van up and wave, and he kind of waved back, like, all right. He probably would have preferred to just give me a dirty look and cuss me out, but... Everyone gets real nice around Christmas is the point I'm trying to make. But you know what? That should be the attitude that we have all year long, even when it gets hot, right? Even when everyone in Tucson gets hot and cranky and, and stuffy and everything like that, you know, we should still have maintain this attitude of wanting to glorify God with our lives, of wanting to, to bring peace and goodwill toward men. But again, it's something you have to work at. It's something that has to be maintained. So let's not just think about this tonight. Let's keep this going, you know, through, through this coming year. Let's make this a year where we endeavor to have unity among the brethren, you know, unity in our homes, unity, uh, you know, peace with God. Maybe we're out of sorts with God in our life. Maybe it's time to, you know, you're saved, and maybe it's time to get some things right with God and, and have peace there in your heart with Him. 
and get some things right so that you can do what? So that you can bring goodwill toward all men, you know, through the preaching of the gospel peace. Let's go ahead and pray.